I'm very lucky to be here with um, Kate Smurthwaite, who's uh, in Australia performing at the moment in the Fringe Festival, and I think has got other gigs coming up in Adelaide and Hobart. Um, and welcome to, welcome to Australia. Hope you're coping with the heat. Yes, I love it. It's like minus two in London right now. So every time I think, oh, it's a bit hot, I think, on the other hand. <laughs> um, I just want to say at the start, at the start that we are recording this on stolen Aboriginal land, so I want to pay acknowledgement to the Noongar elders and um, leaders past and present. Um, so Kate is a British comedian and uh, activist. Mm -hmm. uh, so yeah, it's good to be here. Um, in, it's good to be here with you in Australia. I, I wonder if we could start by just talking about, I guess, the intersection between those two things, mm -hmm. uh, if there, it, to the extent that you feel like there is one. Um, oh, they're absolutely it, like for me, comedy and activism are are absolutely like linked. Which doesn't mean that they have to be for everyone. I have no problem with people who choose to do something that is, you know, clowny and surreal or whatever else. Um, but firstly. There is very clear evidence that, and this might seem terrifying, but jokes change people's minds more effectively than facts do. And like, you know, I wish it were not thus, but yeah, there's an amazing piece of research out of the US done uh, probably about 10, 15 years ago that showed exactly this. So they told some people some, some quite sexist jokes and they gave some other people some sort of sexist facts. And, um, and then they asked them, you know, for their opinions about gender issues all over again. And guess what happened? The ones who'd heard the jokes, their attitudes had shifted. And if it can be used for evil, then it can be used for good. And I think if we look at what's really changed things globally over the last few years, yes, of course, some brilliant campaigners, some brilliant campaigns. But actually, you know, attitudes that we might get from The Daily Show last week tonight, things like that. Um, things that we read in Private Eye, in The Onion, in things like that. Quite often, those are the things that really get into our heads and shift our opinions. And when we're all laughing about something, we're kind of laughing together and that, that kind of sweeps our opinion along. Um, yeah, in a way that, 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 a, that a stiff lecture wouldn't do, in a way people wouldn't come to it if I gave a kind of stiff lecture on the facts about these things, yeah. What message do you want to get across in your comedy? Well, and it's interesting because there are lots of shows, of course, where you come and see a show and it's like, forget about all the world's problems, you know, let's just take an hour away for it. And I feel like, I, I know, I feel like the, the state of the world right now, like we can't really be doing that all the time. It's about time we kind of did have a bit more of a look at it. So, yeah, I talk in my show, uh, I would say about five main issues. I talk about what's going on in terms of the environment and the climate emergency. I talk about what's going on globally in terms of war. I talk about what's going on globally in terms of what we keep calling the cost of living crisis, but I'm, I'm ideologically opposed to that term. Like, oh, how expensive of you to stay alive. Oh, look at you breathing in and out. You've not even thought about the cost, have you? It's a terrifying term. There's, we live on a very um, well-resourced planet. There is no issue of scarcity on this planet. There's enough food for everyone, there's enough accommodation for everyone, there's enough health care for everyone, there's enough doctors to go around, there's enough everything. Um, the issue is greed. The issue is always greed. The issue is always the way that it's hoarded by a small minority and that leaves the rest of us mm. out of pocket and apparently too expensive to be alive. Like if, if, if co the cost of living is too high, change your economic system. Don't, don't discourage people from living. Um, so there's that one. And then I talk about um, what, you know, like the, the, the aftermath of the pandemic, which of course is still ongoing and the, the issue of further diseases around the world and new emerging strains and new emerging uh, illnesses. And then I talk about, so that's sort of war, famine, pestilence and death. And, um, and then I talk about the fifth horse person of the apocalypse, which of course is the media and the way that the media don't cover these issues in with any honesty and instead get sort of distracted on these tiny little trivial issues so much of the time. And we hear so much about three words that Prince Harry said and so little about the next global extinction wave and how it's going to potentially make the entire planet uninhabitable. Yeah. Um, I understand you do a lot of work with refugees and do, um, yeah. this is something in Australia we've been campaigning for a long time because um, Australian refugee policies for now more than 20 years have been particularly atrocious and the Refugee Convention has more or less been completely ripped up. Yeah, and that's exactly what's happening in the UK is we're ripping up. Yeah, do you want to talk about refugee rights? Yeah, no, totally. And we used to export people to Australia and now we're taking what you've started doing and we're doing it. So yeah, obviously you've had a situation for a long time where you've been exporting your refugees. And 
And we've now started doing that in the UK. So we've just literally embarked on this policy of exporting refugees to Rwanda. And it, and it's absolutely frightening, but it must be said that up until this point, we've already had a horrific situation in terms of the treatment of refugees. And I've been, so actually about, and this is a, going back a long time, but a good 15 years ago, the UK, one of the things we did for refugees when they arrived is that we gave them English lessons because magically enough, we thought that they would cope better and integrate into our society better if they understood the language. And then, and this goes back to Tony Blair, we, we, we scrapped that program under Tony Blair and at exactly that same time, I heard about a group of women refugees um, who were looking for support and they'd just lost their English lessons. And I said, I'll do it. And um, I have no English teaching qualifications, but I was just the first person to put my hand up. And I, I ended up then replacing myself with better qualified English teachers. But I stayed friends with this group of women from mostly different parts of Africa, from uh, Congo and Cameroon, and started just running my own little sort of self-run thing where I would take people out for a day because I, I do think that people in those situations have a right to a day off. I think that's like one thing we talk a lot about their right to like safe somewhere to stay and a passport and a visa status and the right to work and the right to do this but actually this is life and one of the things you're also entitled to is a day off and through that I've got to to know and feel very strongly about the situation in the UK and, and, it, and it's horrific and it's only getting worse. And yeah, and unfortunately, Australia is absolutely at the forefront of showing us how badly it could be done. Um, yeah, when in so many other ways, like you have some policies that are more progressive than the UK. There are things about the way things are run in Australia that I really like. The, um, um, what do you have like? So you, first of all, your minimum wage is much higher. Um, and secondly, you have this casual loading on the minimum wage, where if you're offering insecure work, you have to pay a little bit more for it. And in the UK, we have this zero hours contract situation where people are being given work contracts and there are no pre-offered hours. It's like you've got this contract and then each week you find out whether or not you've got any work. And we have the same minimum wage for that, which is still lower than what you've got here anyway. Um, so I'm like, hey, England, like, listen, we could do that. But also Australia, listen, we could all do better on refugees. And also, I mean, the UK is not doing great when it comes to green energy. I think we could be doing a lot more. But in the UK, whenever we talk about getting more green energy, people say, oh, you know, but the sun, it's just not reliable. Hello, Australia. It's always sunny. Like, oh my goodness, if we can almost do some of it with solar power in the UK, you can do all of it here. I can't go outside without immediately frying. You've got so much sun, you know. It's so strange that we think of Australia as this country that's rich in, you know, mining resources. We're gonna dig up gold, we're gonna dig up fossil fuels, all this kind of stuff. Like, you've got this amazing resource there. Um, and you're all worried about putting on your factor 50 and the hole in the ozone layer and don't get skin cancer. But like, this is a resource. And it's a hugely, hugely valuable resource. And these days, you know, renewable energy is much, much, much cheaper than fossil fuel energy. And, and it's ridiculous because people talk about the cost of setting up a fossil fuel plant versus a solar plant. But you forget that the input to the solar plant is free and permanent. It's just there. You never have to buy more oil. You never have to buy more coal. It's just there. And you've just got this amazing resource. And, and to, yeah, to be paying to put, you know, petrol into your car when you could have the free stuff from the sky, you know, it, it, when you think about it in that context, it's, it's amazing that it's not happening more and more. Now, you mentioned the minimum wage in Australia and you also previously mentioned the cost of living. Yeah. Um, I'm aware that in Britain at the moment there is a huge strike wave, although not that you would necessarily mm -hmm. know it in Australia by looking at the mainstream media here. But did you want to talk about that and I guess, also I guess the context of it, like, I mean, it, this feels like it's a quite a big, um, uh, push back against neoliberalism. We've got the Tory government in crisis, mm -hmm. but also the Labour opposition is not putting their best foot forward anymore. Yeah, I mean, I mean, obviously we've had this huge situation in the UK where it, it's very difficult in the media climate that we live in for genuinely left-wing progressive socialist people to get into into power. And so the, the left wing in the UK had had an election and, and just to appease the, the, the crazy extremists, they um, they put up a genuinely very left wing candidate, um, Jeremy Corbyn. And of course, he he, he won by a landslide because everyone and people up and down the country were singing his name and all this. And the media went on the absolute attack against him. And it's not, you know, and this is the difficult thing with the media. It's not that everything they said was false. That's not the issue. Um, 
you know, the issue is the way the media will pick one small issue and not talk about everybody else's problems. It's that kind of selective focus. And they absolutely went after him in every possible way they could. Um, incidentally, a, a friend of mine is a, a media studies um, postdoctoral researcher and did, actually was part of a team that wrote a report on the coverage of Jeremy Corbyn. They found that 75% of media stories about him contained like a demonstrable lie. Like that's that's the measure of it. Like that is that is clearly you know like a misrepresentation. He's being made responsible for something that is actually part of a, a group responsibility. Something that he actually didn't say. He's been quoted out of context. That's twisted what he said. Yeah. Um, so now we have a new uh, left wing supposedly leader who isn't really all that left wing. Um, I mean the clue is in the name. He's called Sir Keir Starmer. I mean you know the the idea that. Yeah, it's just to, to, to accept a knighthood is to, is, to, is to willingly be a part of an establishment and to accept, I don't know, the idea that people would have the letters OBE after their name, like Order of the British Empire. I'm I just like, who would write, yeah, I'm part of the empire on my, like, surely that's a thing we all learn about in school history and are, you know, embarrassed about and ashamed of. Um, but yeah, nonetheless, regardless of what the left is doing, and I do think the left could do much better in the UK, the right is in charge and we have a deeply, deeply flawed electoral system and a hugely biased media. They have a lot of power and it's going to be quite a while until that shifts. And yeah, and they seem to have just taken it and run with it and run with it. Now, we have like 11% inflation now in the UK, but I mean, you've got about 8% here in Australia, right? So we're not, and people, people are sort of putting the difference down to Brexit, which admittedly was a horrendous mistake and has caused all sorts of problems. But the truth is, and this is this is one of these massively over researched facts that I put into my show. Sixty percent of the research of the inflation that we're currently experiencing in the UK is explained by increased corporate profits. So, you know, we're all like, oh, the Brexit voters have have, have messed us up. Oh, it's all about the war in Ukraine and the cost of uh, fuel and all this kind of stuff. All these different theories that people have. But the fact is that the, the British government has allowed the energy companies to put our heating prices to, to double and triple. And whereas in France, they limited the increase to 4%. We've had our, our pension ages now 66, it's going up to 67 and 68. In France, they're trying to move it from 62 to 64 and there's riots in the street. Um, we have to take these matters into our own hand. And right now, I'm delighted to say we have the biggest wave of strikes that I think the UK has ever seen. And we talk about, you know, huge strike waves that took place in like the 70s and stuff in the UK as being these big strike events. But right now, um, the train workers are out, uh, the postal workers have been out, uh, nurses are out, um, teachers are out. I mean, like big industry, um, big chunks of our society, big sectors are out. And we've now got, um, you know, Amazon workers coming out and we've got lots of what you think are, um, you know, corp corporate sectors, what you think are, they're going to have fought so hard against unionization. But in fact, um, yeah, even people like that are now starting to come out. And lots and lots of smaller, you know, all these like little smaller physiotherapists, they've been out for a while, like all these like smaller things. We've got doctors um, coming out. We've got all sorts of like different groups of people coming out. And, and we're also talking about solidarity strikes and other sectors coming out in support of what's going on. So, yeah, the government is insisting that they, that they won't negotiate and they won't do anything and they won't do anything. But, you know, there comes a point where they will have to and that's and, and, and you know and the thing is they wouldn't negotiate before so why not like what are we what have we got to lose here it's hugely important and obviously i'm hugely supportive of it before i left the uk i was doing lots of uh, you know solidarity things on the picket lines and lots of fundraisery things and all that kind of stuff and there's less i can do from here but um if anyone in australia wants to go out you let me know <laughs> i'll be the first one there um uh, supporting it because i think it's the only way that we can get the corporates and the government to listen to us. Um, sadly, they sh we, should, we should have a, a more representative democracy, but we don't. So that's, that's the way forward. I wanted to ask you about um, women's rights. And I guess mm -hmm. one issue which I think is currently, mm -hmm. uh, I think the right is using the issue of transphobia to attack, as they're basically a bridgehead in to attack the entire progressive movement. Obviously mm -hmm. trans people are, are the first victims, but I think, it's, I think the ultimate victims are much wider than that. I yeah. wonder if you've got any comments about that and also more broadly what you would say about women's rights today. 
Yeah, so I think it's really interesting, and, and I must admit, Alex, usually I sort of refuse to discuss the subject, but only because it's always presented in the middle of a big argument. And I actually think that trying to get LGBT people to argue with women's rights campaigners is like just doing the work of the patriarchy. It's just, yeah, like it's great. It's great for rich, straight, white guys if LGBT people and women's rights campaigners exhaust one another um, by fighting with each other. Um, the truth is that there are some areas in which, ah, you know, we really ought to have a little think about how best to balance the needs of two different groups of people. You know, but let's look at it. It's like, first of all, it's, um, it's the prison service. Okay. Um, here's the thing about the prison service. The prison service is massively underfunded and a lot of people in the prison service are not really safe. Now, is making the wrong decision about where we keep individual prisoners who might be, you know, who, who might feel unsafe in this area, is like, is that one tiny little part of the discussion about it? Yeah, it is. And is there a situation where somebody might argue, well, this person identifies as transgender and therefore they would be safer in this situation, but this person might feel uncomfortable given their own experience and, and the trauma that they've been through um, being in the same cell as that person if they haven't been assessed fully and it hasn't all been done carefully. I mean, of course. But like, you know, like before this issue came up, anyone who wasn't on the streets marching for safer prisons, like, okay, it, it's, it's a little tricky. I'm not, you know, like I agree that there should be a careful decision made. I, I'm not convinced that our energies are best spent on it. And then, you know, the other one that comes up, the only other one really is uh, women's sport. And, you know, fairness in sport has been an issue forever. What drugs are people on? What, you know, if you look at, for example, the Paralympics, what, you know, what artificial leg are people running on? Is that, is that fair or is that potentially distorting what shape their body might be if they hadn't, if they weren't an amputee, like, et cetera, et cetera. Like, fairness in sport, I mean, it's a huge issue. Every, every weekend, millions of people argue about their favorite sports team and whether they were treated unfairly and what the rules should be about watching the video footage and all this kind of stuff. Um, and, you know, and so to take those two issues, which are, you know, I think like, like, absolutely, there's never going to be a 100% right, right answer. There isn't a magic, this is A and this is B. They're like, we have to look at it sport by sport, case by case. And ultimately, what we should be doing is funding women's sport much better. And what we should be doing is funding prisons much better so that everybody in them is safe. And the idea that, that we're going to somehow solve this by focusing on the issue of a very small number of transgender people who are caught in the middle of the system, I, I, think, it's, I think it's doing the work of the patriarchy. And that's why, in general, I refuse to participate in debates like this. But I'm glad to say that you haven't presented it to me as a, like a, a raging debate. I always step away from it. And I do feel, in a way, you know, that I'd like to stick up, you know, firstly for trans people and I'd like to stick up for various women's rights activists who I think have been misquoted and treated badly. But when doing that just becomes more and more and more like fanning the flames of this, of this huge fight over, you know, ultimately it, it, it's they're making us fight over the scraps from the table when we should be saying, sorry, could you flip the table over so we can have a proper meal? That's what is at the heart of this for me. Yeah. I read recently that you're polyamorous. I guess yes. I wanted to ask you about that. Um, yeah. in, I guess in particular, do you feel like there's a connection between polyamory and progressive politics or is it just a lifestyle matter and, and unrelated? I mean, for me, it's just like, it's just who I am and it's how like I've lived pretty much all of my adult life and I couldn't live any other way. Like, I think, I think it's interesting that like, like, like for, for myself and a lot of people I know who've, who've stepped into that lifestyle, like I get so used to my freedom that I couldn't, I couldn't go back to living any other way. I would, yeah, I, I, I would be single rather than, rather than, you know, lock myself into a monogamous relationship these days. But I do think, firstly, that monogamy is one of these things, along with, for example, religion, the monarchy, um, you know, and, and, and lots of things about the way that our lives are that, that doesn't get questioned enough. You know, we're not questioning enough, are these oil companies really doing something that's sensible? We're not questioning enough, do we really need this in our society. We're not questioning consumerism. We're not questioning so many things. And I think when you start questioning those things, you know, perhaps the religion that you were raised in as well, things like that, when you start to question those, you find lots of holes in a lot of those things. And, you know, monogamy, compulsory monogamy, absolutely, I think when we question it, there's a lot about it that doesn't make a lot of sense. And I think that, that 
I'm absolutely not against people who've thought about it and gone, actually, this is what I want for my life. But I think for so many people, the opportunity to question it just isn't there. And we're not encouraged to question it. We're just presented it like this is how things are. So I think questioning everything is is good and valid. And and for me, as soon as I started to question monogamy, for me, like the whole premise of it just fell apart. And I also think that there is a way in which we form connections that that being polyamorous for me is, yeah, it is about being able to travel around the world and connect with people from different cultures faster. You know, you sit down and have a coffee with someone once a week. How long is it till you could legitimately ask them to help you move house? Maybe six months, maybe a year. But um, when you're romantically and sexually involved with someone, about two weeks, and I'd feel quite comfortable saying, listen, can you bring a van? Um, which is Which is interesting, isn't it? How much faster we forge these connections and for me traveling around the world is a part of my job there's that's that's how it is that's that's what my job is and it would be very tough on me and i I, there are a lot of performers who have you know a partner back home and it's it's tough it's really tough to do it that way and it's it must be very limiting but for me i'm very privileged to be able to sort of show up in perth and yeah and oh i'll pick you up at the airport then great and i you know slide into hanging out with people who I already have a connection with. And yeah, and I'm not here um, without a sex life either, which is nice, which is great. So I think there's a lot to be said for it. But again, I, only if, you know, I would encourage people to question it, but I wouldn't encourage people to make any decision that they weren't comfortable with. But, you know, on the other hand, put, you know, put a toe in. It's a, it's, it, 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 it's a very different lifestyle. And I think when people get, you know, sort of question some of the, the assumptions they might have been living on, you might be surprised to discover that it, it offers quite a lot. Um, before we began, you mentioned the issue of war, and mm-hmm. um, I think many people in Australia right now are very worried about some of the war hawks um, planning a war against China, and we've already got this sort of this war in Ukraine, which has been a big debate on the left. Do you have any comments you'd like to make about that? Oh yeah, I'm, I've been talking about this, and I talk about it in my show as well. The um, you know the the in the UK, I've been constantly saying I'm against the war, and people are like, "What? You love Putin?" And it's so interesting that, that we immediately, and it's a little bit, I think, like so many other issues, actually, like, like the trans rights issue we've just spoken about, that we have this situation where they're like, well, do you support Ukraine or do you support Russia? And, and there's this amazing piece of middle ground where you could support peace. And, and, and the reaction often seems to be, well, Putin won't agree to peace. Putin won't agree to peace. And that's an interesting point of view, because unless we're sat at the peace table asking him to show up, and asking him to participate in that discussion, well, we can't really say what Putin would or wouldn't agree to. Um, I don't think Putin is right to have invaded anywhere, but I think that he is right that there is stuff going on, you know, NATO expanding, there is stuff going on that, you know, if I was him, it'd make me nervous too. And I don't think the solution for that is for him to invade, and I don't think the solution for that is for the Ukraine, funded by lots of other countries around the world, to react to that in the same way. I think that we should, as an international community, be supporting peace efforts. And by that, I mean helping refugees. By that, I mean encouraging peace talks and sitting at the table. And I also mean, you know, funding hospitals and funding support and, you know, medical and and making sure that we make it our business to be supporting all that side of things. I don't think that pouring more and more money into escalating the war helps because where do we escalate to? Putin has nuclear weapons. We know he does. So what happens when we throw something heavier at Putin? Okay, like this is not creating a situation in which, you know, in which we're getting anywhere. There's only two ways that wars can end. And one is with everybody throwing all the weapons they've got. And in this case, that means planet over or sitting around a peace table. And we can do that now. We can do that in six months time. We can do that after several European cities have been flattened. We can do that, you know, when there's only six of us left alive and the cockroaches are about to take over. You know, we can have a small table with the cockroaches at it. The best thing to do is obviously to start now. And yeah, you might be screaming into the void, asking Putin to attend uh, peace talks that he doesn't want to come to. But, or you can wait six months and then start screaming into that void. Like we should be screaming so loud. And actually, um, I, once I finish here in Perth, before I go on to, I'm taking my show then to Hobart and then to Adelaide, uh, I'm actually dropping through Melbourne because I was a co-writer on a play and the, the lead writer is a local Perth woman uh, called Tiffany Barton. And 
It's a play about the situation in Ukraine and it follows three Ukrainian women of different generations as they seek to escape from Putin's brutality. It's called Not All Dictators and it opens at La Mama uh, at the end of this month. And I'm going to fly into Melbourne and, uh, and just go and see it because I don't think I've ever had a play that I've worked on um, staged before. I've written a few plays and some of them have been heavily commended, but, um, but not actually staged. And uh, yeah, so I'm dying to see it. I'm really excited about it. It's a, it's, it's a dark comedy with an amazing soundtrack and three amazing actresses in it. And um, yeah, and uh, I, I hope people in Melbourne will come see it. I'm, I'm gutted not to be able to stick around and do Melbourne Festival this year. I would love to come and do shows in Melbourne. Um, and my plan hopefully in future years is to try and get out here and do that. But people of Melbourne, there is still an opportunity to see a little bit of my work um, at, uh, yeah, at La Mama in this play, Not All Dictators. Well, I was going to ask you about your shows coming up and how people can see them and connect with you more broadly. And I guess, is there anything else you want to say before we finish up? Um, yeah, so um, now let's talk about my shows. So yes, my show that I'm touring at the moment is called Humanity's Last Hope. And that's exactly what I'm talking about. Like, is it too late? Is there still stuff we can do? What might work? And you know, and, and, but I might add, and I realise that this may not seem obvious, that it's a comedy show, um, like a proper comedy show with jokes and punchlines and silly bits. And some of my solutions to global problems are kind of ridiculous, um, but hopefully it's a way of getting us thinking about you know what the less ridiculous solutions might be. And yeah, it's on in Perth at convenience until the end of the Fringe every day at six o'clock. Um, it's then on in Hobart at the uh, Clubhouse. Uh, and I'm going to say that's March the 5th. And it's then on six nights in Adelaide at uh, Cafe Komodo. Um, but Adelaide Fringe, you can look it up. It's all on Adelaide Fringe and it's all there. Um, and yeah, and then I also run. Um, so I have this late night show called Late with Kate. And it, um, it's been running at the Edinburgh Fringe for like 10 years. And it's like it's a late night show, but it's not rowdy or drunk. It's kind of the most civilized late night show out there. We have special guests and we have fun mucking about with the audience, but not in a kind of, um, not in a being horrible to people way, but in a like having a laugh. It's like a, people call it a cult. It's a little fun club for people who like to do something a little bit different or unusual to get, to, to, to hang out for one more, one more hour and catch a little bit more comedy. And you see a few special guests, you might want to go and see their shows if you enjoy it. So yeah, that runs on Friday nights in Perth at convenience at 10.30. And then it'll also, we're, the idea is that we're going to do it in Adelaide as a little secret after my regular show. Ah, if we feel like it, we'll stick around. So if you come to my show in Adelaide, you know, don't book anything to do afterwards. You'll stick around and we'll, uh, and we'll have a little bit extra. I might have some special guests. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you for having me. Thank you for talking to me.